Okay, so uh, this is the closer, um, and I think we're going to uh, uh, follow Zhu Xing's great example of you know the sort of expedited models. So I will very briefly introduce our next set of speakers, um, uh, uh, and. First is my colleague, Ashley Champagne, who is director of the Center for Digital Scholarship, which is located here at the library. And the second speaker will be Jacob Yu, um, who is one of the students who worked on this project um, in computer science. And he was very instrumental as part of the team in considering uh, the complexity of how we build this site with the kinds of academic objectives that it had and the materials it was working with um, and what tools to use and, and really uh, on the technology end. And he can speak more about that. So um, welcome to you both and Ashley. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, um, Ju Ching, for having me. Um, uh, so I'm here to talk about the, some of the technical creation of the project, but um, as part of the Center for Digital Scholarship, I just want to emphasize that digital scholarship often brings the technical and the human together, and then the project really um, bridges the two. Um, so at our Center for Digital Scholarship, we, we bring together teams and people from all sorts of backgrounds, um, his, historians, uh, people from cu computer science, such as, such as Jacob. Um, and we, we bring them all together to address the central question of the, of the project, um, which is a, a central research question. Um, and when it's digital scholarship, you're really using the digital to help answer that question. Um, and so an example with depicting glory is that, you know, we wanted to tell the story of these 27 maps that were telling the history of China, and we were wondering, you know, how do we do that? Um, and so some of the questions we asked are like, you know, what presentation makes sense to answer the research questions? Um, on the technical end, you know, how is the tool built that, that meets those needs? Um, is the tool itself built and maintained in a way that centers the human, or, or is that just for profit? And what does that mean if we use that tool? Um, what does the digital bring to the research question? Um, and so I'm just briefly going to talk about um, our Center for Digital Scholarship and, and how we work and how that, um, you know, with depicting glory as the project example. Um, so uh, this is our, our mission statement here. We, we provide expertise, services, and teaching in digital scholarship. Um, methodologies, project development, in order to really advance the field of digital scholarship, um, to activate and guide intellectual exploration and, and creativity and support the creation of new scholarship. Um, we have a really rich history here. Um, our CDS was one of the first digital humanities groups in the nation. Uh, we were formed in 1994, and, and Brown itself is home to a series of early paradigmatic digital scholarship projects, such as the, the Women, Women's Writers Project, um, which is now at Northeastern, uh, George Landau's Victorian Web, um, and Hypertext, which predates and anticipates the World Wide Web that's going on here. Um, we, we are also a founding member of Centronet, which um, brings together um, a number of di different uh, digital scholarship centers across the world. Um, we honor this history. We try to honor this history with our website, in part by showing the hundreds of, of staff and students who have worked for our CDS and, and why it is the way it is now. Um, and our team today looks like this. And I think this is one of the reasons why digital scholarship is, is so strong at Brown, is that we have a core staff here um, of people who are, are involved in different you know, subject specialties, like data visualization or um, text mining and things like that. But then we also really uh, work with the whole library and, and across um, Brown as well. So we'll also work with lawyers and um, other staff at other centers um, to help bring the project to life. And they all have really key um, pieces to each project. Um, and it, largely, we do three things. So we've got trainings, um, and we do events, um, and we do projects, which Depicting Glory is, is you know, one of those. Um, so we have a lot of projects. Um, 
we we help develop these projects by trying to have the same kind of intake process. The reason for this is that um, every project brings together a lot of students, um, faculty, people who may be leaving Brown or, or um, in three months or one month, and we want these projects to be really good opportunities for people to work on and and add them, you know, um, to their to their professional profiles. Um, but in in doing this work, we we need to make sure that it's it's organized in in a sp specific way and that we define our project goals and that um, we also make sure to to build on the expertise of our center where where we're taking a project idea and we're also thinking with um, the leader on the project um, for how to build it. Um, so we we take we develop a project we offer advice we we create an organizational system and and we make sure the project parts are safe and centrally located which is no small feat here and and develop preservation plans then um so depicting glory is when this came to the center um you know it's it, this project is so important for the library for many reasons um so it, it highlights of course, these rare, you know, Chinese objects drawn from from our library that have never been organized or written about in this way before um, as a collection, and so we're creating new important digital scholarship that encourages new scholars um, uh, in the field. Um, so all along the way, we're also trying to train uh, the students on the project team, and this illuminates the legacies of of the. China's past on present day efforts um, by the Ch Chinese state and society to come come to terms with the intersection of national power and collective identity. Um, so we did a, a number of things as, as the center for this project, but I just wanted to highlight two of them um, before turning it over to Jacob, which is um, we were, you know, helping to guide the project team on, on documentation to centralize it, and then we were also making a, giving a lot of advice in terms of, of what technical decisions to make along the way. So I'll give a few examples of that. Um, you know, in any digital scholarship project with, with lots of different people, right, um, all these different materials, uh, it, it's really important to make sure that they're all in one place, that they're safe, that we know where they are, um, and that we know how to access them. Um, so we helped uh, the, the student team create a, a technology maintenance documentation with things like passwords um, why did why did you choose the technology you chose um, you know all of these kinds of questions are really rich um, and we want to make sure that we save those as part of our center as a part of Brown and as part of the project um, so we we helped uh, make sure that that was um, that that was there um, and then when it came to technical decisions like this is that um, you know we had those 27 maps right uh, that are sharing this history of of um, China, and we were trying to think through how to present it, and we, you know maybe Jacob will talk about this too. But we, um, you know, thought about all these different kinds of presentations um, for these maps. Um, but um, one of the things that the project goal, one of the project goals, was really to bring together all of these different materials in one project and really create um, a narrative about them. And so we thought, you know, a timeline would be a really one way to do that, um, to bring them all together and be able to see in accordance with, say, um, on the left-hand side, the different events and eras, and then on the, on the bottom here is a timeline. And then each of, each of those um, blocks, those gray blocks, has a, has a hyperlink, and if you click that, it will go to uh, the relevant map. Um, and so you can see that from the original source, uh, which is which are in our repository here as well. Um, I don't know if I can show this, but just because it's, it's a little bit small there. Um, but if I say, um, well, I'll just do this one, expression aggression. Um, so. so that's another example there. Um, so yeah, and I, one of the things we looked at in this, um, in this decision on this timeline was like, is the plugin current? You know, does it have a good history? Are developers working on it now? Um, you know, how was it made? Is it open source? Um, these are all questions that we found this, this particular plugin was really answering those questions in a way that we thought was relevant to the project. Um, and, um, 
we also thought that that the timeline was really useful because it showed the maps together from this bird's eye view. Um, so our project team uh, with all of the great students on it were, were really excellent, I think, in thinking through all these technical choices. And we were, you know, our center was just a part of that guiding effort. Um, and so I'm going to hand it off to, to Jacob to talk more about that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the panel. Uh, I'm Jacob. Um, Brown, class of 22 in applied mathematics and computer science. Um, although I worked with uh, Center for Digital, Digital Scholarship, but I don't consider myself as a real scholar. So I'm really honored to be here uh, among all these uh, brilliant scholars. So, and please bear with me if my presentation doesn't sound as informative. <laughs> So um, I was on the um, digital design team along with Miranda, who unfortunately cannot be uh, with us today. So on behalf of the team, um, let me talk to you about our um, digital part of the project, which is the project website. Um, so hopefully you've already got a chance to look at it, but either way, I'm going to give you a brief um, walkthrough. So this is the home page, and below the title, there's this navigation bar that we can go to each section of the home page. And uh, in particular, we want to go to the unit page, uh, unit section, I mean, uh, where there's like uh, the links to all the pages dedicated to each set of the rare object collection. So let's have a look at one of them. And it has its own introduction and followed by the items themselves and some of the features. And lastly, we have um, the essays from the scholars. Yep. Um, but. What I like to focus on is uh, some of the most um, distinctive features, uh, and not just what they are, but how they became what they are. And let's first look at the section where we showcase the battle paintings. So we are given dozens of these uh, battle paintings, uh, and we want to present them to the website users. OK, that sounds simple. We just list all of them uh, in a web page that uh, looks something like you would see on Amazon, uh, and we add a filter function for uh, a specific location or time. Um, it's both very designer and user friendly, but the question is, um, is it enough to interest the users, especially those who may not have enough knowledge uh, about that part of the history? So uh, we talked to our advisors, including Ashley, about this concern, and they suggest us try out um, Story maps, like Ash, um, Ashley mentioned, um, it's an application where we can have this um, geographical map and as, as the base, and we add images and text on top of it. Um, so we played around with it a little bit and managed to come up with something mm, less boring. So here's how it works. So you can see uh, each painting corresponds to one of the uh, pins on the maps that indicates its location. And uh, we can click on the image to see the full description and accompanying handwritten text. So um, story maps fits perfectly the image-based nature of our projects. And it also adds some interactive element to the section. Um, and even better, uh, it provides us uh, a platform to build our entire website upon, so we looked no further. And next up, I want to talk about another noteworthy feature where we present the historical maps. Um, so once again, we wanted to do something less boring. Um, and um, Professor Lee said, hey, uh, why don't we just uh, make a timeline from all those events uh, of the maps. Uh, we thought that's a great idea, so we jumped right into it. And we quickly found 
a tool called uh, timeline.js, which looks like this. Um, it's super easy to use, and um, it looks kind of nice, uh, which means we don't have to worry about how to make it look better. So we, it all seemed too good to be true uh, before we found some serious drawbacks. So uh, one of them is that the events span um, over two, uh, six centuries, uh, which makes the timeline way too long. So in, it's very difficult to locate a specific event, especially those uh, shorter ones. And um, another deal breaker is that the tool does not support um, text embedding. But we need to have the English translation on those maps for those non-Chinese speakers. Um, so now we have to build a timeline from scratch to address these issues. And we kind of got stuck at that point. Um, and Professor Lee gave us uh, yet another uh, valuable advice. So think about um, what we want the users to see from the timeline. All those events are um, milestones in modern Chinese history. Um, so our aim is to give the, give the users a straightforward view of when these events happen and how they overlap. So how about um, we collect uh, the start and end time for each event and arrange them uh, chronologically. And they form the columns such that uh, the width of the timeline uh, is uh, reasonable. And um, the, the rows are simply all the events, and they are represented by a color bar uh, that indicates uh, when it started and ended. And also, um, each bar has an embedded link to the translated map, uh, which looks like this. And uh, the bar, I mean, uh, because we don't want the translated text to block anything, so you're not seeing the translation right now. But if you click on one of the numbers, uh, the translation will pop up. So now uh, we have something that does the job, but it certainly doesn't look uh, as, as good. Um, so um, we did some polishing and got the final product that Ashley talked about just now, but uh, I'll just uh, give you another uh, demo. So we go to unit one and scroll down to the timeline. And we can full screen to, to get a better view. And as I mentioned, uh, the events form the rows and the um, the years form the columns. And we can clearly see how these events lasted, uh, how long these events lasted and for, uh, in which order. And we can click on one of the, the bar, the link, uh, to open up the, the cor corresponding map uh, and click on one of the numbers to see the translation. So, um, the final version doesn't look amazing um, by any sense, but we tried. Uh, and what really matters is that it conveys our message to the users uh, and hopefully helps the, the users learn something new. And as long as it does, uh, I think it's a successful design. Um, so the two features I shared today carry more meaning than just being different. Um, they witnessed our personal growth as designers. We shift the focus from making everything easy for ourselves to always thinking from user's point of view. Um, so this um, designer-centric to user-centric change is what makes uh, this uh, experiences, experience so precious for us. And lastly, I would like to once again thank Professor Lee for giving us this opportunity to work on something so fulfilling. And uh, the digital uh, advisors for your support and guidance. And thanks to everyone uh, for coming. <clears throat> that was great. Um, just before moving into the discussion phase and wrapping up, I 
do want to acknowledge our partners from media services um, and recognize them. They have boundless patience and calm, and uh, we are great beneficiaries of that always. Um, so thank you very much. So I think this is a great way to end. So we were brought together in this conversation because there was a site that was created, this project depicting glory, and this opportunity to, uh, after really investigating the substance of the site, to kind of get under the hood of, of what it is from a technological and design perspective, seems like a really fitting way to begin to wrap things up. Um, but also, as the symposium was proceeding, um, and knowing that this would be the end and I'd be sort of here uh, doing this, talking, that um, as the discussion of the substantive scholarly matter was going on, I, I just couldn't help throughout really linking these questions of form and substance. And uh, there's no time to get into you know absolutely everything, and I, I have insane notes uh, about all of this, but you know, from the start, this notion uh, that Professor Perdue brought up of, of expansion and the dynamics that creates and the opportunities and the drive for innovation and how that relates to kind of the way we expand knowledge and the way digital technology has enabled uh, and shaped that expansion in our current era and, and then how this project really represents all of that. Um, you know, to all these questions that have come up in so many different ways, um, uh, visual translations, representations of materials that, you know, were happening throughout as we see different iterations of things we were looking at and how they were interpreted and reformulated. But developing this site is yet again another stage in doing that and understanding um, these materials how the knowledge they contain is yet again being reused and adapted and framed in new contexts. And in the site in particular, new context in terms of juxtaposition of these disparate materials and what they're saying across these broad historical themes that in really interesting ways unite them, which is kind of the concept behind the site. So. Um, I guess just to kick things off, um, I, I would throw it to the two of you who were, you know, working under the hood or um, of this, um, how you think about some of those questions as you wrestle with the site and developing it about how you're thinking about the materials that constitute the site in relation to the technology and the kind of the role of the site in that chain of transmission of knowledge and understanding. So, throwing that wide open. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you for that um, great question. Um, I, I was just at the Critical Digital Humanities Conference in Toronto, and, and a lot of the digital humanists there were like, let's throw out the word technical. like." Everyone's doing technical work um, in digital scholarship because even if you're a historian who, who doesn't want to do anything with it, um, you do when you're on a digital scholarship project. You're central to how the project is built, um, and you know I think that's true in a lot of ways. Like a lot of the choices that we make um, in terms of form and aesthetics, like are all informed and often um, inform what content um, and message you can even share. Um, and so uh, that's something that I I really try to emphasize in digital scholarship work is that um, everybody is really critically thinking about the project, um, whether they are, you know, thinking more specifically about um, technical elements or, or, or the content, but they, they certainly um, are so so central and, and, and um, enmeshed together. Um, Thanking Joe and Ashley for your answer and your question. Um, I think for me, it always comes back to this point that um, we're not just making uh, a website 
that looks great to the users, but also we want to show um, the users what we want them to know. So uh, apart from the two features that I talked about, um, there's this uh, personal story I'd like to share um, where um, Miranda and I were looking for um, the title image for the website, and uh, one day I found this cool picture of like a dragon sculpture um, online, and I was like, yeah, this is it. Uh, then um, we talked to the uh, digital experts and Professor Lee about it, and they, they said, um, it certainly looks nice, but um, it doesn't really fit uh, to our website. Why? Because um, it doesn't tell anything specific about a project at all. So um, uh, at the end, we chose uh, to present this uh, a slideshow of all the selected um, rare objects from those collections uh, as our title image. And I think that's a perfect example of like how to think for the uh, users, but not ourselves. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I was quick on the draw. Um, I, as a scholar that's uh, working in the digital humanities and is working with uh, collaborators, uh, this is really present on my mind. I see all the wonderful work you've done on this, um, like really going above and beyond to make these projects come to life. And I wonder um, if you have thoughts about how your work can be credited and you can be given a kind of authorship um, and what that model looks like for um, scholars that want to work with people like you. It's like, I want to work with, um, uh, with, with folks that are going to help me visualize my data, and I want them to be recognized. How does that look, uh, and what does an equitable um, uh, credit look like moving forward? Do you have uh, thoughts about that? I'd love to hear them. Yeah, I, um, I have lots of thoughts on that. Um, well, <laughs> Many different centers do this differently. Um, our, one of the things that we did in, in 2020 when we started um, project management here um, in, in real earnest um, is that we, you know, we had a project charter, which is, was one of the um, documents I, I showed, but that has like roles and responsibilities. But there's also a collaborator's bill of rights there. Um, and we have a template for that, which basically says that we, we are partners in the project. We are not you know, I guess, again, going back to the technical and the, um, the content, we, we are partners in that effort. We are not um, the, the, the technical people that are going to implement um, the idea um, because, because that's always what happens. That the, the faculty member comes with this amazing idea and we think together and we build something in a lot of ways that's new. Um, and so we have that. Um, and that's a that's a template now that we're using, you know, going forward. Brown has a really interesting um, circumstance, particularly because we're such a, a, you know, historic center that has been here for, for years, and we work with faculty that have been here for 20 years, and we're working, you know, working on their projects. So, you know, in each case for us, particularly, it's it's different. Like a lot of times, we might, you know, work out, but we work out some kind of document or understanding. But we always say at the, you know, start of working. Um, that we're partners, and we, you know, and we are, and we are. We're listed as as copies. Um, we're listed on publications. We we recently released two publications on our projects, and and everybody on the team is on as a as a co-author. Um, so we really try to yeah emphasize that um, yeah. First of all, thank you for making such a great website. It's really a wonderful uh, resource. I I'm just curious about. Um, how you hedge against the obsolescence of all this technology over time, and uh, you know what does it look like 20, 30 years down the road? I guess it costs money to keep these sites up, and uh, technology changes. So I don't know what the future of the site will be. Uh, just yeah, that's um, also a great question. Yeah. Um, so 
there, there are a number of, I will just say there's short term things that we're doing on the project and then I think there's like some, some longer term um, things. So uh, this is created in Story Maps. Um, there's a public version of Story Maps and there's one that's Brown owns, um, which is great, you get more features. Um, so this is Brown owned um, and um, it, that ownership model is something we, I've been working hard on um, typically like uh, if you create a story map site at Brown and you leave, then the site w won't stay. Um, that's that's what has to happen, right? Otherwise, we'd have a million sites. Um, but as a central unit, as a CDS, then we have we have a, a shared account. So that's then owned by a, a shared group at the library that's in a stable you know place. So that's one thing that we do, and that's a short term thing. Like the longer term thing, which I think your question is really getting at, is like, well, this is on story maps and what happens is story maps goes away. Um, and that's always a concern, but we also, you know, there are certain things we can do and, and that we're really thinking through it at um, our Center for Digital Scholarship, which is that, um, you know, we can certainly archive the site. We can, we can archive the bits, we can save, you know, everything. Now, is that exactly how the site is? Like, it's, it's not. So we also wanna preserve um, the site as it is and, and have videos and, and different documentation. Um, we wanna save the documentation too. We always see that as part of the project as, as well. Um, so there's, there's certainly that, but um, yeah, it's, it's a really hard question because anytime you ask somebody about their project and they're like, how are you gonna preserve it? You can't, you, I think you just can't, you can't preserve it exactly as it's gonna be forever. And that's, that's a really hard reality, but we can certainly preserve it so that it can be recreated in maybe not story maps in a hundred years, but, but whatever is the next you know, relevant technology at that time. And if we preserve those bits, then you know, hopefully in a hundred years, the next person will be like, I've got the bits. I'll use you know whatever tool is there. So, um, I just want to sorry. Um, yeah, I just want to add to it really quick. Um, uh, I think everything we present on the website comes from this uh, Brown Digital Repository. I think this is a very well maintained archive, uh, and as long as we have it, uh, um, I think in twenty years maybe there's like a metaverse version of story maps and uh, we can just upload everything onto that and we can have a, a beautiful website yeah all right thanks i just want to acknowledge um the importance of what you're doing and i think um i mean in so many ways you're you're bringing us together you're making these materials more accessible we're learning more about them um and you're getting it out there to the public which is great and you're inventing the wheel all the time. So I want to I want to acknowledge that, but I also want to share um, an experience I had this morning. I, you know, I woke up early and I thought I was I was planning to. I'm not great with technology, but I thought, well, maybe if I could just go to the website, I could just scroll through each of the 27 Taiwan maps as I talk about them. So I was doing that as I also was figuring out how I could actually drag them drop into a PowerPoint pretty easily, it was fine. But I realized the sequence of the maps was different than the sequence in which I had ordered my descriptions based on the, what, Mirador stuff I had gotten from the library catalog. They had been labeled one to 27, I thought probably in accordance with the original um, sequence because I know each one is labeled and so the the map of um, Chiang Kai-shek's contributions to the building of Taiwan instead of summing it up at the end was number 14 I thought oh <laughs> that's interesting and then I realized that the sequence they were in actually made a lot of sense because the beginning date of each one, you know, it started with the Ming, right? And Chiang Kai-shek at 14 was 1887, and then it went on beyond there. But I, I wonder, I don't know why they got resequenced, but I wonder if it might have something to do with the timeline. And um, just point out, while that might, you know, just seem the logical thing to do, that it, it does kind of, change the way they can be re interpreted if they don't appear in the sequence in which the original was meant to appear as part of the 
the map sequence that goes with the book on modern Chinese history. So I don't want to be the curmudgeon, but I just want to say, you know, this is complicated, and this is one complication that came up today. And I don't know all the details about it, but I just thought, well, let's put it out there and see. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, right. There's editorial decision making uh, in this medium as in others, and uh, there must be a feedback loop link somewhere, I hope, but uh, you know, I, I think that's the kind of thing that if that editorial decision is not currently visible uh, in the site, that that's you know, probably something that should be surfaced. But, but you know, that's the kind of scholarly yeah. feedback that's really helpful. Yeah, actually I have an answer to that, because yeah, uh, they're supposed to be like two separate systems, one for the timeline and one for the original like, uh, order of things. But we, I think at some point in time, we mix them up together. So yeah, sorry for that. And um, I'll definitely look into it and fix that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free to be in touch, like, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's have that, uh, whatever you call um, collegiality and the back and forth working together because um, that'd be great. I also wanted to really acknowledge the tremendous amount of work and effort that's gone into the production of the site. It's really extraordinary. Um, and one of the ways in which we all institutionally acknowledge the kind of work that's gone into these sites is by articulating the research outcomes for the higher ups in the institutions where we where we all you know where we all do our jobs. And and I was striking. I was what I was listening to all of the today. I was thinking about how one would articulate the research outcomes of this project collectively. And I could imagine a sort of research outcome that focuses on it on it pedagogically that you've developed a new tool for visualizing a body of material for students for people to learn about the history of China in this period. I thought about a research outcome in terms of what's been produced here collectively for us, that this is a site that by juxtapi facilitating the juxtaposition of different materials has catalyzed a conversation among specialists in different fields um, that wouldn't have happened otherwise if it hadn't been for the site. I thought about the, the research outcome of the sort of facilitating access of, of the scholars to the material and facilitating access to the broader community, to the results of the research that, that came out of it. And the, and the fourth kind of question, I think this is more of a sort of a challenge for going forward um, for everyone who's involved in the production and the use of the, of the site, is, is the site as a tool for thinking. So to what extent are those of us who are researchers in the field actively using the site as a way to ask questions of the materials that we're studying that we wouldn't be able to ask without the site? And it struck me there that that the map, like I was thinking about Rebecca's question about how we might draw finer distinctions among a given group of battle prints, and the fact that you have the story maps with this kind of geographic distribution, showing geographic distribution of the battles represented in those images is a way to begin thinking about the geographic distribution and maybe using geography to, to articulate some of the differences between these different representational strategies. But it was striking to me that, that in the presentations today, no one had quite gone that far in terms of actually using the site as a, as a tool for research, um, you know, for, for the questions that are driving the research. And so this is just sort of an open-ended question for everyone of, 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 are there ways that you could see new functionalities being added? I don't mean to make work, new work for anyone, but, but sort of new ways of, of interacting between the site and, and the research questions that might facilitate answering or at least exploring some of the many questions that have been raised over the course of, over the course of today. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for that. That's, um, you articulated that so well. Um, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, one of the things that the, the site gives you is just this, this platform that from, from anywhere you can, you can view all of these amazing resources together and you have now all of these essays about those works that we didn't have before. So the, what that does for, say, my, myself, who's, you know, I'm a, I'm a scholar of American literature, you know, is that I get to then access all of those resources together and, and be able to think through that. And I think one of the great things about digital scholarship projects is that, like, we don't know yet how it's going to be used necessarily. Um, but it just even in this conversation now, and like, um, as, as you were sharing, like, we can we can 
continue to add to the site. And we can, you know, as we hear feedback, that's where that feedback is so valuable because, you know, if we if we do hear, um, you know, more feedback and, and if, if others in the room have, have suggestions, we can incorporate that um, and, and make sure that um, the site is, is, is doing the, the work that, that we really hope that it will do, so. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. And actually, I'm following uh, Professor Moser's comments and also maybe a suggestion <laughs> for the website. I'm thinking about the language aspect because we're talking about Qing and, and actually the technical tool is very useful and easy for us to textualize things and translation things, maybe not that perfect. But um, the reason why I'm thinking about this is because I was so impressed by some other uh, uh, digital humanities projects starting from like 10 years ago, the Tianlongshan, and people recollect the, uh, the objects separated in different places. And that's how technical can achieve uh, separation in reality. But in the virtual world, we get things back and get it back to the original state. And that state actually tells a new story. Uh, so, so today is super inspiring for me because I, I never thought, thought it in that way, but Qing Dynasty is a, such a potential topic because we have the different language and we have the inter-regional uh, uh, inter relationship with the surrounding areas. And also it's, an, it, it's a webbed relationship in the whole world. And that's, I, I won't say separation, but that's this first uh, information status maybe can not fixed, but can be represented in another way in the virtual world. And uh, this is, I don't know if I'm too utopia, or, but I can see this is what a um, virtual website can achieve. My question might be a little technical. So I, I feel like your timeline project looks very nice. And in that case, you are indexing all those historical events by the time. And in other projects, you, um, you are indexing the events by, by their location on the map, say the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom events. I'm so I'm wondering, what if you want to index events by both things? Say, for instance, you might, want to, you might be curious, hey, um, where are those events happen within a period of time? Or maybe you want to focus one period of time and see how, the, how things change along the time. Um, what would be a reasonable, what would you do if you want to visualize things in that way? Oh, I think, uh, thank you for, for your question, first of all. I think that's a very uh, great point to uh, bring up and um, I think at this time, we don't have a solution yet, but um, I think it's uh, possible for us to combine those two features together. Maybe some some time in the future, there's uh, a tool that allows us to do so, or we can just uh, uh, build our uh, own web page from scratch uh, that implements uh, these two features together. And uh, yeah, thank you for your advice. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I think we've got. Two last ones, maybe quick ones. Yeah, I'm just um, picking up on the, the last um, thread about uh, future directions. Um, so uh, I don't know, uh, maybe this, I'm not sure if this is what Fayar, what you were trying to get at, but um, I was wondering if both from an institutional point of view and um, from a um, logistical point of view, um, what you think might be um, the desirability and the possibility of incorporating more active links to the multiple editions of some of the things that we've talked about today. So um, since that came up 
so often and and you know professor brooke did all this work he showed us like um you know through um what exists um perhaps in the public domain on other library websites is how much do you want this to be a presentation of what brown has or working out from a presentation of what brown has how it links to things in other repositories um, because clearly that's one major area of scholarly investigation Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I would I would turn it to to Ching yeah. Li on that one. <laughs> it's a rather uh, specific response to Jeff's suggestions. I, I I don't know it's appropriate to drag anymore, but uh, it's really the um, the story map um, is really impressive when I work on those paintings and it helps you to pin down the battle the location of battlefield and by looking at the trace set and you can. Uh, kind of retrospectively reconstruct the mental um, spatial rationale when the painters uh, make a sequence of arrange the narrative of the sequence of their painting. It is not a, uh, what you may assume following a temporal sequence sometimes because those battles they they jump back and back and forth and you can by, by visu visualizing it uh, with your tool we can actually figure out something in, in their mind. And uh, so that's. That's great. But maybe we can follow the suggestion that since we have these questions about the future direction of the site, maybe the director of the site would be <laughs> someone to opine on that. <laughs> and then you can then you can bring the gavel down. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea you were going to jump this on me. Uh, <laughs> but well, thank you so much for everyone being here and being super you know, perseverance going through the day. And um, we have all the productions next door, and we're planning to use those reproductions for teaching purposes. Um, and um, I want to thank all the scholars for coming here and contributing your research, your ideas from totally different perspectives on this particular group of objects, especially the battles. Those battles are so well fought today. <laughs> so, well, I just want to thank you all contributing from different perspectives to, the, to this and hopefully this will continue in our next project. And thank you, it's a real privilege to have you here to share with your scholarship. Thank you. Thank you.